Hello and welcome to our viewers on cruxinvestor.com and also to our listeners on Cruxcast. Here today with Stephen Roman, who's the Chairman, President and CEO of Global Atomic. We're going to be talking to him about a number of subjects which you can look at in the description below. So click on the relevant timestamp and that'll take you to that part of the video to see what is being discussed. Also, I can ask that you click the button in the corner of the screen to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Plus, if you want to see more videos like this, please click the notification bell. So, good morning, Stephen. How are you? Good morning, Matthew. I'm doing well. Good. Well, welcome to London. Thank you. You're nice uh, to be here. Well, yeah, I mean, you're, you're a busy guy at the moment. So you're, we've got the WNA is obviously going on in the background with the uranium, sorry, but you're obviously having one or two meetings as well. So That's right. Thanks for making the time to see us. Pleasure. So you're going to tell us about the Global Atomic story. So why yes. don't you give us a one-minute summary and we'll pick it up from there. Okay. At Global Atomic, I started with a an ex-partner uh, at Denison Mines, Clifford Frame, back in 2005. And uh, we were out uh, basically looking for uranium uh, around the world. Uh, our background with Denison Mines, of mm. course, one of the biggest producers yeah. in the world, was started by my father, as a matter of fact. Oh, I uh, so uh, we got that going. And um, at the time, uh, we, we wanted to uh, look in Niger because Niger mm. was a, is a producer. It didn't have a lot of uh, international investment. It basically had been tied up by the French for many years. My associate, George Flack, who I worked with for many years, uh, was in Niger at the time working on a gold project. And, mm. and I called George and I said, uh, you know, is there any uranium mm. potential there, uh, properties that we could uh, start doing exploration on? Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, you should come over. The, go the government is just opening up the, the doors for yep. foreign investors. So we went over in 05, and uh, by 2007, we uh, put together a nice package of six uh, really high-profile properties. Yeah. Started our exploration program. So uh, since then, uh, we've developed four uranium deposits mm -hmm. there with one major discovery called DASA. Okay. That we discovered in 2010. Okay, so we're going to get in, into that in a minute, but you've also got operations in Turkey. Turkey, uh, yes, that's another company Clifford and I started in 2005 at the same time to actually look for base metals yep. around the world. And we ended up in Turkey on a primary zinc deposit. Uh, and uh, then the, two, the, uh, the crash of 2008 happened, mm -hmm. financial crisis. So we you know, didn't want to leave the country empty handed. So we, we found a, a shutdown plant in a place called Iskenderun, right mm -hmm. on the coast of the mm -hmm. Mediterranean. And it had been processing electric arc furnace dust, so right. waste from steel mills. Okay. And uh, so we bought that plant and uh, refurbished it, got it going again uh, by the end of 2009. And it's been making money ever since. It has been making money, and I think that's sort of one of the attractive features that investors at the Global Atomic are looking at. Right. Is the fact that this thing is it's quite a sim simple process in, in, in many ways. And the, well, having looked at the, at the <coughs> economics, it's, it's, it's quite profitable. It's very profitable. So talk about some of the numbers there, because I think it has a yeah, big impact. Yeah, so last, last year our EBITDA was $13 million, mm -hmm. and uh, we have a currently a 49% share. We've turned it into a joint venture. So mm -hmm. because that wasn't our primary business, uh, operating a plant like this, it's a 56-meter-long it's a kiln. It's like a cement plant. Yeah. You put the waste in there with uh, some feedstock mm -hmm. from... Uh, coking coal, et cetera, and you, uh, you volatize the zinc that's left in the waste, and then you condense it and you make a very high-grade zinc concentrate, right. running 70%. Our biggest uh, customers are Nearstar and Glencore, so we ship right out of our own port facility in Turkey uh, that we mm. have with the, with the steel mills there, and ship this concentrate to Europe. Right, so the, presumably the 51% shareholder is local? No, the 51% shareholder is the, the world's biggest company in this space. It's a company called Befeza Zinc. Right. They trade on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. Right. So we brought them in. They were always interested to get into Turkey and the fact that we were already there operating. Okay. We, we actually accelerated their 
their plans to get into country. You know, they didn't have to do a standalone that would right. have taken five years. Okay. So they came in and they paid us uh, to buy into the project. Mm -hmm. We uh, agreed to make them operator, and so now we have a very, uh, very good joint venture. With and what's them. that throwing off for you? It, in what, what's in your total, uh, well, our share was thirteen million. So out of forty-nine, so let's say twenty-six, twenty-seven million total right. EBITDA last year. Now what we've done uh, in, the, in, in 2019 mm -hmm. is we shut the old plant down, we completely demolished it, mm -hmm. and we built a completely new plant that's now running. Okay. So within six months, we tore down an old plant, built a new plant, and so this is now doubling our capacity from 30 million pounds a year of zinc to 60 million pounds a year of zinc production. Okay, when's that payback? That pays out in about eight months. Okay, so not, and then it'll be free cash flow after that. That's right. Okay, so, and, and what sort of quantum are we talking about in terms of the free cash flow component for you? Well, I mean, really, uh, at sixty million pounds at a dollar a pound, that's sixty million dollars a mm -hmm. year U.S. dollars. Uh, your costs are going to be, you know, in the thirty forty percent range. So yeah. the rest is, uh, you know, free so, cash so then, flow. And, and that net contribution, so you're not running or operating that business, it's something that you, you started, you monetize, and someone else is operating, okay? So That's that right. sounds smart to me. You, it's throwing off cash, what are you gonna do with that cash? Well, so what we did, now that was in a company called Silvermet. Yep. Again, started by myself. Global Atomic was a private company. Mm -hmm. So uh, between George Flack and myself, we raised about $60 million for mm -hmm. this company. And we uh, really use that uh, to develop the Big DASA project. Right. So, you know, what we needed is, of course, liquidity for our shareholders. So we decided since nobody really cared about a small zinc recycler, we would merge the two companies. So mm -hmm. about a year ago, we merged them mm -hmm. and uh, gave everybody liquidity. We gave the, uh, the SilverMet shareholders a, a big asset in, in our DASA project mm -hmm. and gave the Global shareholders liquidity on uh, now the Toronto uh, Senior Board, Toronto Stock Exchange, yep. but also the cash flow from that zinc can help us develop the, the large uranium right. assets. So, so that's the ease. Of th so I think that's well understood, and that's when you move into a kind of free cash flow position, there's obviously a lot more around. So that's, that's great. Totally understand that. Can we talk about Global Atomic? Right. Okay, I want to get into the detail of it. It's in the uranium space. It's it is. in Niger, which is a you know very well known yes. uh, space for uranium. It's the largest good. producer. Absolutely, and high grade for Africa. Right. Yeah. But before we do, let's talk about the team. Okay? Right. Because I'm a strong believer and strong advocate that the, the team needs to know what they're doing, be able to talk about what they're doing, be able to, to deliver that. So, look, who's on the team? Who have you brought on board? Well, you know what. Uh, George and I really got things going. Mm -hmm. uh, George is a professional geologist, has been working in West Africa since uh, the 80s. We started working together in Ghana on a gold project oh, uh, that Denison yeah. had in 1985 yeah. called Bogasu. And uh, we have, of course, the fact that I, my, my roots are with Denison Mines. I had a lot of talent from there that actually came mm. and joined us. So. Uh, mm. Uh, one of our prime consultants is a mining engineer, Royal School of Mines, uh, named Fergus Kerr. Mm -hmm. uh, he was running all Denison's operations in Elliott Lake. So he's got uranium experience? Big time. Okay. So yeah. he, was, he was the guy you brought in. Okay. And uh, we brought in another guy named Peter Wollenberg, Dr. Peter Wollenberg. He was the head of uh, Arriva's uranium department in yeah. North America. Got it. So uh, Peter is a geologist, and he was uh, credited with the discovery of a number of uranium deposits. Uh, one of the big ones is in, in the Northwest Territories in Canada. So he is also on our team working with us. Okay. Uh, then we have uh, people uh, in Africa that have been there working with us, and with, with George, some senior uranium geologists that are part of our team in country. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have uh, our CFO, Rain Lahari, he's uh, ex-Pricewaterhouse Coopers, uh, that uh, 
you know, has been involved in the mining business for a long time. Yeah, and finally, uh, the last uh, gentleman I can name here as part of our team mm -hmm. is uh, is Merlin Mar Johnson. He's right. a geologist. He's uh, worked with many um, companies, mm -hmm. uh, mineral companies, uh, exploration companies, right. and he'll be uh, our London liaison. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, helping us with our feasibility process and management here right. based in London. Okay, and who of that team actually manages <coughs> these in-country relationships? Well, I mean, basically George Flack is our VP Exploration. He's also a vice chairman of the company, right. uh, but he spends a lot of time in Africa. Uh, he lives in Africa, and okay. uh, so he manages that. Merlin is now helping him with that whole okay. aspect as well. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what, what we've done is, you know, as a, as a foundation with a couple of individuals, of course, Clifford Frame was mining engineer and he was the president mm -hmm. of Denison Mines. Mm. So, you know, we, we put together a real core team and uh, as we move along and complete feasibility study, we, we add to that team as we require right. to, to fill out that uh, so, I, so I, need, I need to kind of point out to people here the importance of what you've just said, because I always say to people, M mining's tough. Mining okay? is mining tough. Mining is tough. Uranium mining, that's a whole other ball, ball game. That's okay? right. So if you haven't done it before, it's a case of you don't know what you don't know, right? Because it's got, not only has it got the, all the, the mining risks associated with it, it's all, <coughs> also got all that kind of geopolitical risk to regulation around it, safety, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to have been through that to understand what you're getting into. So if you're making investments, you need to consider if this, you think this team understands what it's doing. So that's a big deal. You've, you've, you've deliberately gone about putting a, a very well-versed and experienced uranium team together. Absolutely. That was a big consideration. Yeah, yeah. no, and, and you okay. know, being in the uranium business, uh, I started working underground as a miner at, Del at Denison right. at, at 19. Right. So I've been in the uranium business uh, most of my life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Denison was the biggest uranium producer in the world from Elliott Lake. Uh, my father built the town there and uh, right. we employed uh, thousands of people. And, you know, so uranium, uh, our big customers were initially the Japanese, mm -hmm. uh, various utilities there. TEPCO was one of our biggest uh, mm -hmm. customers. Uh, I was involved with uh, price negotiations, sales right. of uranium, mining uranium, exploring right. for uranium. So we, we've been in this business a long time. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and then the big contract we made was with Ontario Hydro. Mm -hmm. Uh, for 126 million pounds. That was one of the biggest uh, contracts for uranium ever in the mm. world. That's amazing. Okay, so you, what, what I'm hearing is that you, you put a lot of store by having the right team of people who've kind of been there from, the develop, from exploration through to actually selling product into market. And, and the, I would argue from what I've been hearing over the past few days and the past few months interviewing uranium companies, the exp getting out of the ground is, is difficult, but that's where the that's where the difficulty actually can yeah, it gets gets even harder from there. Getting it into market, understanding buying cycles, right. understanding uh, logistics around physically moving uranium around the world and getting it to where it needs to be, and all of the cost issues because you don't necessarily get paid the second it comes out of the ground. You know, ma man managing that, that's, that's, it's quite complex. So it sounds like you've got a, a team who knows what they're doing, so that's great. But let's, let's get into the project itself, because I want to understand your impression of Niger, doing business there, how are you going to go about doing it? What are the barriers, what are the things that you're seeing that you're dealing with to be able to do business in Niger? So we'll see what, tell us about the country first. Well, Niger, uh, and you know, as I mentioned before, we've been working in West Africa since the uh, mid '80s, and uh, you know, we've got a lot of experience in in all the West African countries. Mm. Niger uh, is primarily desert, uh, so from a point of view of logistics, it's quite easy to get around. Mm. We happen to be located. Uh, in an area called the Timur Soy Basin, which mm -hmm. is uh, like the Athabasca Basin in Canada, right? Uh, it's got good infrastructure, so that's that's a good thing. Like like what? What, what do you? Well, uh, highways, uh, power lines, uh, you know, towns. Right. 
there's there's the, the the main core production for Niger comes from the timber soy basin. So uh, Orano Mining, formerly called Arriva, mm. uh, started mining there in about 1970. Right, so okay. the two mines that they have, Colmanac and Somer, have been running that long. Right. Uh, our deposit is located just about 100 kilometers south of those two mines. And then we have another mine operated by CNNC, the Chinese National mm. Nuclear Corporation, about 100 kilometers to the southwest of us. Mm. So we're in an area that's uh, very well known for uranium mining. Uh, we, we've particularly zeroed in on that area because of, you know, uh, obviously yeah. good geology and, uh, and the fact that uh, we did have infrastructure. So, so, why, so why haven't the French picked, if they've been there for so long, why haven't the French picked up this, this land? Well, the, the French owned all of this land. Right. But because of what happened in 2005 with the government effectively telling the French Listen, we're not going to allow you to own the entire basin. Well, just sit on it. We, we, yeah, yeah, and yeah. sit on a land bank. It. Yeah. Uh, so we want other companies in here. We want other companies spending money developing projects. Right. So we're right. going to leave you with eight concessions, and we're going to divvy up the rest to people that are interested. Right, okay. So that's when we picked up our six. Right, so you're talking about the basin there, okay? If I look at the Athabasca Basin, the stories we've heard, there are some great stories, I mean, amazing stories, high grade, and fantastic, but there's some very deep assets, yeah. you know, that has their cost and stuff. So, you know, can you describe the basin here and, you know, where you sit on that and why you're saying it's a, it's a great place to be? Yeah, well, for instance, uh, you know, we started and we, we went to an area that uh, had, had previous work done on it by the Japanese. We developed a surface deposit. Well, yeah, meaning, meaning you inherited data from them? or we, uh, the, the areas that we picked up uh, were known to host uranium. Uh, so there had been limited amount of work. Mm. There were uh, outcrops, there were drill holes, there mm. was data available. So we went through all of this data. Mm. And we picked the areas specifically that were exciting. Right. But, you know, of course, when we went in to follow up, on some of them, we found uh, deposits that could be exploited. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of drilling on our Tinigarand concession. Yeah. But it was, uh, it was a typical, you know, lower grade African surface uranium project. We were looking for something bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in elephant country here. So we followed our nose. We did a lot of prospecting on surface, uh, hand, you know, Geiger counters walking yeah. across the ground. And beside one of our other projects called Daji, about a, a mile away, we found a blowout, we call it. I call it What's a blowout. That mean? It means that from down below, something is percolated up a crack. Okay, literally and, a blowout. And, it's, and right. it's, okay. left, it's left a blob on surface. Okay. Uh, and that blob, uh, f first of all, the Geiger counters went crazy. And yeah, like right, right, right okay. pegged it. Like a movie. You like I it? I like it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we took this material, brought it to Canada, yeah. assayed it. It was running at 30% uranium. Okay. So we said, holy smoke. I mean, this is, this is something unseen in Africa. Mm. And uh, so we said, okay, well, we need to start working around this area. So mm. we, we laid out a drill program mm -hmm. and we outlined uh, a lot of lower grade material, like a halo around this, this mm -hmm. blowout. Mm -hmm. And it was going down to about 20 or 30 meters. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it was a reasonable mm -hmm. amount of uranium, but the grades weren't there. So we said like, where is this coming from? Yeah. And you know, in, in Niger, they had a preconceived notion that when you got to a volcanic tooth horizon in your drilling mm -hmm. called the Abinki Formation, right. they stopped drilling. Okay. Because they said there's nothing below it. Okay. What so sort of level are we talking about? That, that was probably 50 or 60 meters down. Okay, so nothing really. So, um, so we said, no, no, there, there's got to be more to this story. So we said, okay, listen, we're, we're going to forget about what all the local geologists think and what the preconceived notions were. We're going to drill through this abinki. Right. And when we drilled through this abinki, we hit the mother load. Right. So this Abinki had, had created a, a, an impervious like a cap, cap too, and right, on top of it a mudstone right. were in a graben, so a down faulted block covered okay. with a mudstone, Abinki, 
it, it totally sealed this deposit from the surface except for that little so that little right, shoot that which came is up. Sca- so you're able to you know paint that picture of what what is looking like underground quite easily as a result. Then, yes, presumably. yes. So we've done about a hundred and forty thousand meters okay. of drilling there now. It's a whole shallow drilling by the sounds of it. Well, no, we did the shallow, but we we drilled right down to about uh, seven hundred meters. So as far, far as that, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, you know, that, that whole graben now, what we've discovered, it's got a, a large uh, deposit sitting under that Abinke formation that uh, is spectacular. So, so far we've drilled off about 250 million pounds. Mm-hmm. We've got grades in it running over 20% uranium. Okay. Uh, we've got large areas that are running at uh, you know one to four percent uranium. Right. Um, but you know overall, I mean, it's it's just a spectacular deposit. It's more significant than most other uranium deposits in Africa. Some of the it's, other it, other it deposits. It is, and of course, this is this is right out of yeah. Peter Wollenberg's mouth. It's the largest, highest grade sandstone hosted uranium deposit in the world. Okay. This is this is quite a statement, and he said that at a at a PDAC uh, talk yeah. where he had a room full of people and very technical. But, let, but let's qualify that, okay? Because you know, if you we, we we're trying to educate our audience about uranium and which investments yes. to look for and why they should look at certain companies, not others. So yeah. most people understand the Athabasca Basin, very very high grade deposits there. You've got Australia, you've got Kazakhstan, and obviously you've got Africa. They're all slightly different deposits with their own attributes and their own negatives too, in the sense, you know, some people are pro-mining and some aren't, uh, and some are you know, not necessarily free trading, uh, as, as it were. But what exactly do you think you've got here um, in Niger? It's one of the better regions for African uranium mining, but... What do, you, what do you think you've got? Have you got any numbers that you can throw? In fact, yeah. before you answer that, right. I'm going to put the blind down here because I, I, I can okay. say both of us are being blinded here. So um, okay. you don't mind. No I'm problem. Down. I'm just going to gently do this. There we go. There you go. That's a I'm like a, it's quite professional, isn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, like I've done it before. Yeah, so, no, so listen, uh, just to give you a bit of a, uh, uh, numbers on our project. Yeah. Uh, so we have currently about 250 million pounds in right. the DASA deposit. That's if you good. if you take it at the current metal price, about twenty five dollars a pound. That's about you know six and a half billion U S dollars metal value sitting there at the moment. Right. So that's a big it's, number. That's a, that's a big chunk of six, no. six billion ish sort of number, which is great. But one. You need to be able to mine economically. That's right. And two, I think the obviously the whole market is is hoping that the uranium price recovers, and then you've got to work out what you can get out of the ground for at the point you decide to go back in, in, into market, right? So, all of the usual mining rules apply there, but that's a big number. It's still a big number. You've got it's a, a big number in the ground. Yes, absolutely. And and you know it all boils down to economics. So uh, I think the DASA stands out in that regard because Mm -hmm. the material, the the mineralized material comes right to surface. We can start mining right from surface, open pit. That's correct. Okay, so it keeps the cost down. Keeps our cost down. But at some point you're going to have to go underground, aren't you? Well, I would say uh, eventually as the deposit goes deeper, you would have to make that decision from an economic point of view. Right. Uh, many cases you mine an open pit down to let's say 300 meters and then mm. you go in with a ramp from the pit mm. and you continue mining down to six, 800 meters. Mm. You know, uh, Chuki Camara, the big copper project in Chile, they've mined that thing down to 800 to 900 meters. It's a massive pit. Uh, so these things are, are you uh, capable, at. but uh, you know that's something that'll happen 30 or 40 years from now. Right. So for the next 10, 10 years, it's going to be a very easily mined open pit, right from surface, low strip ratio. Mm. Uh, we've done all the metallurgical test work on the material. Uh, the uranium uh, leaches with uh, typical sulfuric acid leaching. Mm. There's no nasties in the ore. So it should be a very uh, low-cost producer, mm-hmm. 
Uh, Kazakhstan currently has the lowest production cost sure. with in-situ leaching. Sure. But I would say that our cost, typically we would be able to mine a pound to process and put it in a drum for $120 a pound. Uh, figure that would be a, a typical open pit with a standalone plant. A plant would be in the $300 million range. Right. Uh, so we've been looking obviously at that option as a base case, but we've been looking at other options of actually starting with a, a heap leach operation. Mm -hmm which uh, could significantly lower your cost because your capex would be much lower, your production costs would be lower, uh, processing costs. So we, we've estimated uh, for a, an initial heap leach operation, very low strip ratio, mm -hmm. uh, we'd be in the 10 to $15 a pound range. Wow. So, uh, you know, I think even at $25, we can show a very healthy profit from initial operations. Uh, you know, the mine wouldn't actually get into production. We're doing the feasibility over the next 12 months and then applying for our mining permit. We right. should have that by, you know, the end of uh, next year, early 21. Uh, so this could be a very profitable initial startup operation with a low capex number. And a contribution coming from Turkey. That's correct. Well, okay, the, the, the Turkey, see the Turkey uh, aspect, uh, and people ask, like, why did we do that? But, you know, with that very solid cash flow coming out of Turkey, mm. you, it gives you many financing options uh, where we don't have to dilute the shareholders. We can, we can do some sort of a note that's backed by the cash flow from Turkey to actually build the mine. So you can, le you can leverage, leverage it. That. That's right. That, that becomes very interesting. Well, yeah. in a non-dilutory sense. That's right. Interesting. Okay. Um, let's, let's, so let's come back to Niger. Okay. You, you, you're starting a study, or there's a study going on, yes. and you'll get a much firmer... What, so what type of study is that? Well, this is a feasibility it's study. The feasibility so that will be the one that we would present to the government in order to get our mining license. Mining license, license right. etc. Okay. And the... I mean, obviously, there's a few other players in and around you. Um, and I note that you have had conversations with them? Well, actually, we've signed a, an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding right. with, uh, with Orano Mining. Yeah. So we did that in uh, July of 2017. For what? So the idea there was that we would be jointly studying the ideas of potentially shipping ore to their plants right. in our lead. Right. So they have the Komanak mine, the Somer mine, both up there. Uh, you know, the, uh, the idea was that uh, by us uh, shipping ore, it mm. could, of course, get us started very quickly without a plant. Yeah. Um, and it would augment the supply of ore that they have at their operations so they could extend the life of those operations. Right. So that you've signed an MEU to be able to access and share information, which allows you to make an assessment as to whether you want to do that or not. All the, right. all the economics need to be decided as part of the feasibility study, yes, I, I yes. guess. Okay, that, that, that's kind of interesting. So that whole tolling relationship, given the amount of hands you've got on the ground, getting into early cash flow, right? I guess is the bit that interests you. You've got to just work out and see if that makes sense for you. Exactly. Because obviously CapEx for building a plant is uh, quite large. Your own plant would be quite yeah, large. Yeah, I mean, a heat and, leach and plant would, wouldn't be uh, as much as a, a, you know, a conventional sure. a uranium plant. But it's still a, a fairly significant capex, I would say, in the, in the hundred million range. Yeah. Um, a, a, a conventional plant, you'd be in the three hundred million. So you know, these are things that we have to take into consideration. We thought as a value opportunity, doing mm. something with Arano at early stages, mm. you know, could start generating cash flow. Uh, yeah. So we're you know we're in discussions with them about doing something like that. Right. Okay. So at at, at some point, I'm. When's, when's, the, when's the study actually due? Oh, we won't be finished until June of next year. Right, so at some point you're going to have to make some commercial decisions based yes. around how much money you need going in the ground. Right. And what relationships you want to form and, you know, and what you're going to say to the marketplace. So June next year is the, 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 the time. I would say that. That, that we would have all the decisions by then. Of course, we're going to be putting up out updates uh, throughout the 
the yeah, next uh, 12 months. Of course. Uh, you know, the other component is the government. Uh, the government wants to see us in production tomorrow. Well, so, of course, but th th their considerations are around employment, taxation, exactly. royalties, sure. etc. Absolutely. Of course, right? Absolutely. This is their number one revenue generator in the country, yeah. is uranium mining. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons we're there. I mean, in Canada, these are fantastic deposits in the Athabasca, but it takes minimum 10 years, maybe up to 20 or 30 years yeah. to permit those mines. In Niger, four to six months. So, the, you know, it's, it's a whole different game. They got, they got some different drivers, haven't they? They have different drivers. Well, right. when it's, it's the only game in town, really, and now they have some oil there that yeah. the Chinese are developing. But really, uranium is the mainstay of that country. Because, I mean, this comes on to the, the, the question, and we, we, talked about, we talked about it earlier with regards to buying cycles, right? We, right. We, let's not get into the macro story. I think that's a, you know, well covered with it. certainly a lot of the interviews we've done, and, you know, and I think people are sort of comfortable with you know, where that's going on the demand side, okay? But for you, and what it means for you and your shareholders, any new shareholders coming in, is understanding how quickly can you get into production? And this, there's a bunch of factors going on. Feasibility, study, you're gonna make an economic decision at that point. You've then got to apply for a mining license. You're saying that's a relatively quick process because there's a lot of uranium mines uh, already operating. There are, well, there are in Niger, but yeah. on top of that, it's a, it's a quick process. It's a very well-defined process in Niger. Right, okay. <clears throat> So that happens, and then it's a question of which option you choose to go with in terms of how you start producing or processing your ore. What's that timeline look like? You're getting into production by? I would say uh, get into production by, uh, well, uh, you know, if, if, if Orano would like some feed by 2021, mm -hmm. we, we could start then. Okay. If we have to build a plant, it would be probably 18 to 24 months later. Mm. So, you know, it depends what scenario you go with. That's your decision? Well, we have to, to look at the economics, That's what Matthew. Saying. At the end of the day, yeah. what can you do to move it ahead quickly and make money for shareholders? Okay. Let me, okay. So that's great. That's what this interview is about. It's about making money for shareholders. Why I'm where I'm coming at it from anyway, is so let's understand what happens next. What are the options? I want to understand what's happening in your head. What are you thinking about? You're building something great here in Niger, by the sounds of it. You, you, you believe you are. You've also got some optionality at, at what point you check out, right? You could get a strategic partner. You could hand the keys over, say, there you go, someone we've, 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 we've created value here, uh, or you can build this thing out. What, what are you thinking? Well, we're mine builders. Um, I just finished building a mine in Ontario and Canada, a gold mine. Mm -hmm. uh, a company's called Heart Gold. Right. And uh, it's, it's Ontario's and Canada's newest gold mine probably in the last 10 or 20 years. Right. So, you know, we, we can take projects right from exploration right to production. Mm -hmm. um, I had a project in Northern Ontario, a company called Gold Eagle Mines mm -hmm. Limited. So we made a big discovery in Red Lake, Ontario, mm -hmm. and uh, we were already uh, working on sinking an exploration shaft, buying the equipment for that, mm -hmm. and we were approached by Gold Corp. So they were interested in buying our project and uh, you know, we, we assessed the situation and, and I made a deal with Gold Corp for $1.5 billion for that gold deposit. That's a great day at the office. So it was a good day at the office. All of our shareholders were very happy. Yeah. Uh, many of them made tens of millions of dollars on that transaction. There are a lot of those shareholders are now in yeah. Global Atomic, they, they backed me on the next uh, deal. So I have a track record of making money for shareholders mm -hmm. and uh, I believe you know you have to assess things as they come along. We, mm -hmm. we, uh, we would like to develop this project because there really, frankly, is none other like it mm -hmm. in Africa. Uh, there are very good projects in Canada, but the timeline to develop those is very long. 
So I think ours is exceptional from that point of view, both in the size, grade, value, mm -hmm. and time that you can actually start making money. So, so you know, mm -hmm. as just sorry to, mm -hmm. to answer your question, there we're, we have the French in Niger, we have the Chinese in Niger, we have the Russians in Niger, we have mm -hmm. the Indians in Niger. Everybody's looking for something like this. So you know what, if a deal comes in the door, you have to assess it. You have to talk to the shareholders, say, would you like to have a, a buyout at some premium. great price, yeah. premium, mm -hmm. and everybody get a big dividend, big payout? Mm -hmm. You know, you have to assess these things as they come along. In the meantime, we continue to create value by moving this ahead. Right. We de-risk this project. Yeah. I guess that's, that's the answer every CEO has got to give me, right? They've got to go, we're going to build this thing, because I think you get that discount when you say that, we're, no, we're, uh, we're just developers. We're going to take it to a point and we're going to get it, but you, you, you've got to be able to show that you can deliver this, don't you? Absolutely. Right. And I think, uh, and you, you would argue with the team that you've got, not only is it about finding it, but building minds is, is something that you're very comfortable with. Absolutely. Right. Done okay. it before many times. So I've got to ask, you've got the right team, <clears throat> for exploration, development, and production, you're telling me. You've got a great asset, I'm hearing. Okay. Finance. Are you going to need to raise any capital, or are we going to use all the money from Turkey to develop this thing out? Well, I think at this point in time, uh, we've raised a little bit of money because there's been a lot of institutional <laughs> interest in this project. Yeah. Uh, we have about five million cash on board now, right. and Turkey's starting to kick out cash as yeah. we speak. Mm -hmm. So our new plant is just being turned on now. <clears throat> so we get management fees and sales commissions every month, and sure. then annually we get a big dividend payout. Is it so enough? Oh, yeah, that would be enough to move this project ahead, yes. Right. Depending on which route you go with, I, I, I presume there's a caveat there. Yeah. Okay, but that decision's not made till June next year. That's right. Okay, okay. What are the other barriers? What are the other obstacles that you need to, <coughs> you can see coming, which you're going to have to deal with or manage, because it's all about risk mitigation at your business, right? Every day, little fires to put out. What are you seeing as some of the things that you need to be dealing with between now and the point at which you get into production in Niger? Well, I think uh, Niger, uh, you know, of course, one of the big issues that, that comes up is security in the country. Right. Um, so we've, we've been there op operating and uh, running projects for uh, many years now. Uh, we have a good security the system in place. Yeah. <clears throat> the uh, Niger government uh, wants to attract foreign investment, so they're really clued in on the security situation. The Timur soy basin is, is seen as a strategic area, mm. so they have a lot of military there. The Americans have built a new military base just 100 kilometers south of us. The French have one 100 kilometers north of us. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the area is very well patrolled. Uh, Niger is totally aligned with the West as far as, uh, you know, uh, being the hub of security for West Africa. So, you know, there are these, uh, I would say, sporadic attacks from, from various <laughs> Al-Qaeda factions in, right. in West Africa. But uh, Niger's managed to keep things fairly under control for some time now, and of course, we expect them to continue that, and mm -hmm. particularly with the American presence there uh, and, and uranium being the, the material, they don't want uh, that being jeopardized. Mm. So uh, That's it, know, has always been, I think, with the, with the Americans. That's it. For sure. I mean, but, and what else? What, what, what else are you sort of seeing? No, I think, uh, you know, we, we, there's, there's good uh, trained labor force there because there's been uranium mining going on there for 50 years. So I think we have a lot of people interested in coming to work for Global Atomic. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's really uh, getting the feasibility done and getting the capital organized, uh, whether through some sort of a leverage uh, yeah. facility that using our cash flow from, from Turkey. Or, or coming up with uh, potentially a, a JV partner. Maybe the, the French or the Chinese or the Russians are interested in farming into the project. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are all things we have to look at over the next year or two. Okay, okay. Um, now talk about the markets, okay? 
your, your shareholder, well, I assume your shareholders will want you to be talking, giving guidance, directing them as to you know, what you're up to, but you've got new investors looking to come in, pick a uranium team to go after. What are you telling them? Why is it Global Atomic versus the other Well, I think companies? it's Global Atomic, number one, we're a profitable company. We're not coming to the market unusual. every few months. Yeah. It, that's very unusual. Yeah. Number two is the, the size and quality of the asset. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just nothing like it out there with a short timeline to production. So mm -hmm. that would be, that would be the, the, the top qualifiers, uh, I would say, is an uh, excellent project, uh, good jurisdiction, uh, very quick permitting timelines, uh, definitely growth potential there. This thing could get even bigger than it is. Mm. Uh, and the profitability of the company as we currently sit. Plus the team has done it before. We've done it a few times. Not many people can say that. <laughs> Not many people can say that. <clears throat> okay, so um, I, I buy all that, that you do have your points of differentiation in what is, you know, has been a difficult market for the last year for uranium players. What are, you, what are you seeing happening in the next 12 months in the uranium space generally? I know we would, I said we wouldn't talk about macro, but just with regards to some of the companies and, and players in this space, what's your sort of sense of you know, how they're going to fare? Well, the, the, the companies that have really outstanding assets, you know, they, they may not be able to move them along very quickly, mm. but uh, <clears throat> they'll always have a, a, a value there. The, the lower grade projects, I, I think, are going to slowly fall away. Uh, uranium, I think, is going to stay reasonably flat for the next couple of years. I mean, it'll move a little bit. But, uh, you know, there's in the last three years, four years, there's been, uh, and including this year, about 45 new reactors built in the world. Yeah. Uh, there's another 150 scheduled to be built in the mm. world. Uh, the uranium is going to be in big demand. There, there, there is a need. I mean, I, I mentioned specifically about what, the, what type of companies you think or what companies need to be able to survive. Because you've given a timeline there, it's quite interesting. I've, I've heard it all the last three days, the last few months, since 232, about the timing, <coughs> the timing of that, right? You know, there's lots of people that need it to be before Christmas. <laughs> right? Price discovery and real quick because they've got cash flow issues and that comes on to one of the points you've made. If you don't have cash, you've got to work out how you, what, what business model you employ to survive. If it's a two year timeline for this slow recovery, that's going to put a lot of pressure on a lot of companies and they're going to have to think about how they raise this capital, what they have to give away, what it's going to cost them, the cost of that money. Right, so that, that's really important. So whether their asset is good or not, but the ones with, you know, lesser assets, they're going to have a tough time, right? They will have a very tough time. Yeah. See, you know, I mean, that's good for you. It's good for people, people, people like you. Well, the good thing about our company is we have very solid cash flow stream mm. that is basically not reliant on a deposit. Yeah. Yeah, you've kind of almost yeah. mitigated the risk there. It's it's in a separate commodity, separate country, separate company. Yeah. So there's no kind of correlation in a way in terms of the risk. That's right. And, uh, you know, even if things take a little bit longer on one side, uh, you know, you, you don't have to come to the market to, to keep the lights on. You, you've got... you got optionality. You've got optionality. Right. It's very important. And uh, I think people are starting to realize that now. That sort of sets Global Atomic apart from a lot of companies. Yeah. But do you think that's been priced into your market cap now? Or do you think there's think a, ways, so. a ways to go? I think the market cap right now is around 70 million Canadian dollars. Uh, you what, know, what, you, what, what's you, been given the, what, what, where are they? people attributing the value there? Is it the Turkish asset or is it what you've got under the ground? In the well, that, uh, you know what? I think based on the way our partner Befeza trades at about 10 times EBITDA, yeah. if we take the same for us, we should be trading at you know, $1.50. Right. Uh, and that's without any value to the uh, uranium asset at all. Uh, you, you get the uranium for free. 
That's interesting. So, you know, as this uh, new plant now cranks up and we start kicking out, uh, you know, 20, 30 million EBITDA annually, uh, our, our shares are, are going to move up just on the zinc asset alone. The uranium is a, is a huge bonus for our shareholders. It's a bonus. So I think, you know, perhaps maybe even getting a slight discount because there's a liability. There's a cost of, the, you know, there's a cost to well, putting you, that, you getting that into you. production, right? So <laughs> that people are thinking, <clears throat> does that mean dilution or are these guys going to come up with a way of getting that finance, which doesn't dilute me? So until you can answer that question. Well, I'm a big shareholder. I, I, I continue to buy shares and put money into the I company. Saw. And I uh, you know what? I, I think uh, says a lot. It, it, we, we've yeah. kept we've kept the share capital and the dilution very low. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we expect to continue to have that strategy. Okay. Low dilution and uh, leverage what we have in order to develop something that's that's worth billions of dollars. So you don't think it's worth like getting a, just a little bit and give you a little bit of headroom for the unexpected? Well, there might be, but uh, you know. It won't be a lot? No, no. Okay. Well, okay. no, there's a couple of institutions that have uh, approached us that have expressed an interest to have a position. Uh, you know, we've said, well, you know, okay. it's something we'll consider at the right price. So you might facilitate that to but get the right be, people on board, yeah. again, to give you optionality going forward, but it's not, right. we're not talking a huge amount of money. No. Okay, interesting. Interesting approach. Well, like, Stephen, I really appreciate the story. It's the first time our viewers have heard this story. Um, we know a lot about it because people talk about it. Okay, uh, it's an unusual position you're in, and I think investors considering uranium as part of the portfolio should look at Globatomic seriously because of the reasons we stated, you know, the management team's experience, the, the cash flowing, very unusual, the scale of the asset in Africa, um, and all of those mitigating risks that we've, we've just gone through in terms of how you're gonna manage this thing going forward. It's impressive, so thank you very much for your time, sir. Uh, it's nice to meet you. Thanks very much for watching. We hope you enjoyed that. And, and if you did, please click the button in the corner of the screen to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also catch us on our website, cruxinvestor.com and Cruxcast, our podcast series. Plus most days you can catch us on LinkedIn and Twitter. We'd love getting your feedback, so please keep that coming and we'll speak to you again soon.